Today on the show, from critical role, Matthew Mercer, narrating a scene in the Matrix novelized by the seven-time Emmy-winning writer Josh Lieb, plus Will Hines. It's The Novelizers. Don't want your popcorn, don't want your milk duds, don't want my shoes stuck in pools of sticky cola. Don't show me romance, don't show me fist fights, just show me words pretty loud under the book light. Yeah, baby, novelize the movie. Give me sentences, paragraphs, and nothing to see. Yeah, novelize the movie. Write a book and turn it in. Welcome to The Novelizers, the podcast where we take classic films not based on books and then turn them into books. Impossible, you say? Let me break it down for you. See, we divide the movies into scenes and assign each one to a different hilarious TV comedy writer. Then we get someone with an amazing voice, say the star of a famous D&D podcast, to narrate each chapter. This season on the podcast, we're novelizing The Matrix, that movie where, well, we're still at the beginning and I don't want to spoil anything yet. Let's just say, don't worry. Keanu's not going to spend the entire movie in that office job. But, okay, what's happened in the movie so far? Catch us up, Kevin. All right, so this is where we finally meet Neo, who is sleeping in his apartment. His computer tells him to wake up and follow the white rabbit. He then gets a knock at the door, and there's a group of thugs, and they invited him to the club, and one of the girls had a white rabbit on her shoulder. So Neo follows him, you know, he goes to the club, and that's where he meets Trinity. They banter for a little bit, you know, throwing a misogynist comment here and there and boom. She warns him that he's in trouble and that there's answers he's looking for that will find him. Judging by my smooth radio announcer voice, you might think The Novelizers is a super slick multi-million dollar media empire. Actually, we're just a bunch of comedy writers and comedians with a passion project trying to make your day a little better. But putting out a podcast isn't free and it takes a lot of time. If you enjoy this podcast, please look us up on Patreon and pitch in a buck or two. Today's chapter was novelized by Josh Lieb, whose credits include The Daily Show, The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, Schmigadoon, Silicon Valley, What We Do in the Shadows, and more. You can check out his hilarious substack, Josh Lieb Can't Draw, where he describes cartoons he can't draw and gets readers to draw them for him. He's also the author of I Am a Genius of Unspeakable Evil and I Want to Be Your Class President and Rat Scalibur, Chronicles of the Low Realm. And it was narrated by Matthew Mercer. You know, his amazingly popular and super fucking funny critical role podcast and media empire. You've also heard his voice in some of the world's most popular video games like Fallout 4 and Final Fantasy 7. Matthew Mercer, novelize us. Chapter 3, A Glitch in the Matrix. Novelized by Josh Lieb. Narrated by Matthew Mercer. Clang, 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 clang. Anderson rolled over in bed and looked at the clock. 918. It was still today. Shit, 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 shit. He'd thought for sure he'd ended it. Yesterday, that had to be the end. But it wasn't. Again. Off to work. Again. His boss's office. Again. You have a problem with authority, Mr. Anderson. His boss was warning him that he was this close to getting fired. Anderson zoned out. He'd heard it all before, obviously. He looked at his boss, tried to appear respectful, deferential. He thought about all the other days he'd spent with his boss, Patrick about all the different paths he'd tried. The days when he'd convinced Patrick to leave the office with him before the agents arrived. He didn't tell Patrick that part. Just for a quick drink, a walk in the park, a discreet meeting in a midtown hotel room. Uh, so many midtown hotel rooms. He thought about the one time he'd convinced Patrick to leave his wife for him. Anderson had been sure that was the answer, the happy ending. But it had ended with him standing on Patrick's Long Island lawn at midnight, with Patrick's wife screaming and crying at him, and the screaming and crying merging into the clang, 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 clang of the alarm and Anderson rolling over in bed in the clock reading 918 and chit, 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 chit. Patrick was still talking. Anderson could remember the way Patrick's belly smelled, the mole under his left armpit, the way he giggled when he climaxed. The memories made Anderson feel cold inside. Anderson knew Patrick didn't remember anything. Squee, squee, squee. The window cleaner was hard at work, like always. Anderson tried not to think about him, about Lars, about the days he'd convinced Lars to leave the office with him, about the midtown hotel rooms. But Lars wasn't like Patrick. Lars had been special. Lars had hurt. The thought, what if he convinced Patrick and Lars to leave the office with him? What if he set them up? Maybe a little champagne, some light brunch? Yeah, and then he shook it off. He'd tried that before, days and days ago. It hadn't worked. 
Patrick's aftershave had clashed with the ammonia in Lars's window cleaning solution, creating a toxic cloud that had destroyed one of Manhattan's oldest midtown hotels. Anderson had succumbed to the cloud, woken up in the clang, 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 just like always. He was in his cubicle now. Nothing had happened yet. This was always the best time of his day. And then Boris arrived with the package. Thomas Anderson? Asked Boris like it was nothing. Like he, Anderson, meant nothing to him. Because Anderson didn't mean anything to Boris. Not today. Yeah, that's me, said Anderson. Like Boris meant nothing. Like Boris meant nothing. The thought was insane. The thought was maddening. Anderson pushed it away and ripped open the envelope. There was the phone. It pinged. He answered it. Hello? He asked, just like always. Hello, Neo. Do you know who this is? Asked the man with the deep voice. Morpheus, asked Anderson. That usually worked best. He had to act surprised here. Mystified. Scared. Morpheus, or whoever it was, didn't like it when Anderson predicted what words he was going to say next. And he didn't like it when Anderson explained that he was stuck in a time loop, doomed to repeat the same mundane day over and over again. And Morpheus really didn't like it when Anderson suggested a discreet meeting at a midtown hotel room. Morpheus was kind of a dick about that, actually. But what was Anderson supposed to do? That it worked with Patrick and Lars and Boris? Oh, Boris. He only had so many moves. Morpheus told him to peek over his cubicle at the elevator bank so he could see the agents arriving. Anderson did so. There they were, just like always. So was Sharon. She was pointing in his direction as usual. <laughs> oh, good old Sharon. Anderson caught himself before he smirked at the memory. Go to a midtown hotel? On a work day, Sharon? Not likely. Sharon was old-fashioned. She insisted on getting married first, and of course that meant meeting Sharon's parents. Uh, Anderson remembered all the drives they'd taken to her family farm in Old Lyme, all the sincere conversations he'd had with Sharon's mom and dad about life, about the Yankees, about the advisability of letting their firstborn, best-loved child elope with a guy from the office, a guy she'd barely even talked to before today. Uh, the old man would twist his liver-spotted fingers on the ancient kitchen table as he considered Anderson's pitch. Mom would polish a spot with the edge of her apron, a spot that was already relentlessly clean. How many family dinners had this table seen? How much love? How much anguish? Uh, Anderson couldn't help loving these people. His name was Abel. She was just mom. They were simple folk, potato farmers, and they were sincerely considering giving Anderson their blessing. But even on the occasions when they'd relent, when they'd waved misty-eyed at the departing couple as they drove to the nearest justice of the peace, Anderson's hell had intended. He'd gone to sleep with his wife in his arms, and he'd woken up to clang, clang, clang at 9.18. Anderson stopped smiling. He remembered the time, the terrible time, the desperate time, that he'd invited Mom and Abel to meet him at a midtown hotel. That was the last time he'd gone home with Sharon, because he remembered that they'd said yes. So Sharon was a dead end which meant he had nothing better to do than crawl to the cubicle across the aisle, like always, with Morpheus barking in his ear. Then he ran down the aisle to Patrick's office. Patrick wasn't there. Neither was Lars. Where did they go when the agent showed up? He usually didn't go that far in this timeline. Maybe they both had diarrhea or something. At the same time, he'd make sure to watch them tomorrow. He locked the door and stepped out the window. He tiptoed along the ledge toward the scaffolding. <sighs> Whatever Morpheus wanted. He'd gone into autopilot. This was a pretty boring run. Sometimes he'd try to lighten the mood when Morpheus called. Pretend Morpheus had gotten the wrong number. Chico's Pizza, what can I get you, pal? <laughs> it was fun to make Morpheus hang up and call back. Morpheus got so frustrated. Listen, you little bitch, I'm trying to save your life. Anderson would hang up squealing with laughter. <laughs> Sometimes he pretended he didn't understand English. No habla inglés, señor Morfeo. Uh, Anderson's Spanish was terrible, but it was good enough for the joke. Uh, one time, he tried to convince Morpheus that he, Anderson, was Morpheus, and that Morpheus was Anderson. He started telling Morpheus to peek over the cubicle, to sneak across the aisle, all that stuff. Morpheus hated that. <sighs> Whoever Morpheus was, he didn't have much of a sense of humor. He thought about the days, the many days, when he'd just said screw it and skipped work. He'd bought winning lottery tickets, just in case this was the time it ended. He'd gone to the horse track and won every race. He started taking piano lessons, each one the first, as far as his teacher knew. He was a concert-level pianist now. No one would ever hear him play. He reached around the corner to get to the scaffolding and dropped the phone. It fell, what, a million feet? Ah, uh, that's what it looked like. Well, that was new. Orpheus was always telling him whenever he let it go this far. 
to edge along the ledge to the scaffolding and to use that to climb to the roof. What Morpheus didn't tell Anderson was that edging along the window ledge, a million feet in the air, was hard. Really freaking hard. Harder than learning piano or seducing his boss or pooping in the middle of the skating rink at Rockefeller Center, which he'd once done five days running just because... In his long life, and at this point Anderson could only roughly estimate how long his life had been, he'd only found one thing harder than walking along this ledge. Getting his heart broken by Boris. Hard? Anderson left bitterly to himself. Shit, that had been easy. He knew he'd gone nuts before. He didn't like to remember those days. One time he'd installed a bomb on a bus, set it to go off if it went below 60. He'd robbed banks while wearing a Richard Nixon mask. He'd killed... God, how many men had he killed? Why did it matter? They were all alive again anyway. He looked down, a million feet, or thereabouts. He thought about yesterday, the day he'd finally ended it. He thought, the day he'd muster up the courage to jump. No, not courage, desperation. In the end, he was only able to do it because he'd convinced himself that he might land on Boris. Or Lars. Lars would be good too. Five seconds of freefall, one moment of pure, empty bliss. And then, clang, 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 screw it, he was going back inside. Whatever the agents had to offer couldn't be worse than this. Thanks, Matthew. Every episode, we interview someone who actually worked on the film, The Matrix. Kevin, who'd you talk to today? This week, I get to interview the amazing Will Hines. Cool. Let's hear it. Hey, everybody. This is Kevin Carter here, and I'm with Will Hines. He is the slime PA for the movie The Matrix. Will, how's it going today? Oh, so good. So good, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I want to let you know um, you have a soothing voice. Uh, oh, I was angry, you know what I'm saying, before we got on here, but now I'm calm. I'm By the way, you were angry before we started and you just got calm? I just got calm when I heard you, when I heard your voice. It really, Man. really slowed me down a little bit. What's a slime PA? You know, slime is a goop. It is a viscous, thick uh, uh, oil. Uh, the Matrix has a lot of scenes with a lot of slime. Probably most prominently is the scene when Neo wakes up in his pod. He's covered in slime, mm -hmm. uh, and that was my big moment to shine. How, how did how did uh, Keanu Reeves like feel like had knowing that he had to be in all that slime? He didn't know it was going to happen. It was a surprise sliming. He thought it was just going to be a dry pod. We told him that it was going to be a bunch of comfy blankets and pillows. Mm -hmm. And then we just said, "Okay, shut your eyes. We're going to put the we're going to put the blankets and pillows around you." And he shut his eyes. And then I just dumped, you know, four big Gatorade coolers worth of slime right onto him, caught him by surprise, and that helps him acting. Mm -hmm. You know, because Neo doesn't is not expecting to wake up in slime. Exactly. So it helps if Keanu Reeves doesn't expect that he's gonna gonna wake up in slime so we dumped three or four big coolers of slime onto him and then shut the pod and locked him in there for i'm gonna say seven hours wow and we left the set and he's screaming you just, you just, you just left the he's set. alone he thinks it's over he told me later he thought he was gonna die and i was like that's good um and then we come in seven hours later get the cameras back in come back from lunch get crafty set up call action open it up boom and that's the shot you see in the movie. Well, I, I will say um, it looked very real of him coming out of that because I thought like, man, he must have, he really sold it well knowing that uh, he was, he, he's almost dying. Well, actually, I guess he didn't sell it because he was actually, right. actually dying. He is, yeah, he was actually he dying is a now. great actor. And if he had to sell it, I think he probably would do a good job. But why make it hard for him where he has to act? Why not just trap him in a slime pod I don't know if it was seven hours. It might have been six and a half. Mm -hmm. And then so that when he wakes up, it's natural. You know, he doesn't have to do anything. We see real confusion and fear mm -hmm. on his face. Yeah, that's, that's good. Because as you were talking, I was looking it up. Like, how long can a, can a human last in slime? And they said the limit was six and a half. Seven would have killed him. Um, was he angry? Like, you know, you guys left me. Yeah, he was. Uh, he quit um, the Matrix for a couple days um, until I had to go apologize. Uh, I had to go to his home in Malibu and just personally apologize and to make it up to him I locked myself in a slime pod in his house for mm -hmm. six and a half hours 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, turnabout is fair play. He could just kind of have his time lording over me in a slime pod, which I was, you know, if it makes the star happy, I'm happy to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so was the was the was the director in on this? Because I, I hear a lot of, you know, so I did this, I did this. Did was the director in on, on on trapping him and stuff like that? No. This was a surprise. I Okay. My plan was to trap Keanu in the slime pod and the Wachowskis uh were not aware of the plan, so I also had them trapped in slime pods. So the DP was in on it, most of the PAs, head gaffer, best boy, key grip, we were all in on it. But the directors and Keanu Reeves were not in on it. Uh, so I trapped the Wachowskis and slime pods just to get rid of him for a little while. I did the directors first, and Keanu laughed. He's like, that's hilarious. And I was like, it is. Now you get in your pod where we're going to put comfy blankets and pillows. And he's like laughing. He gets in there, boom, slimed, locked, six and a half hours. So as a, as a PA, mm. you know, j- just a PA. I'm actually an assistant PA. There's actually a... I'm a, an assistant PA to the art department. Okay, so so for for the list, we want to make sure that PA does means personal assistant, correct? Yes. So you were an assistant to a PA. The art department has a head PA. I was that guy's assistant, so I was a PA PAA really. Gotcha. So 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 where do you get the um the uh, the moxie? Let's go with moxie. Where do you get the moxie to to pull off a stunt like that for Keanu Reeves? Because you're just an assistant to the, P, the PA. You know what I'm saying? What 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 made you take that leap? I read at the time, I read an article that Keanu loves to prepare, that he is very responsible about preparing for his roles as an actor, okay? And I read that when he did Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, that he would get into character uh, for like 10 or 15 minutes before rolling so that he'd Mm -hmm. be ready. And I was like, that sounds like the kind of guy who's going to love being trapped in a slime pot. So I wasn't really worried about what Keanu would think because I figured he would love it, which I was wrong about. Mm-hmm. How how did you get into this this business? I lied is what I did. They asked for somebody with intense experience and I told them that I had done the special effects for Star Wars. Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like wait. I told them that I was in charge of the special effects for the first Star Wars movie. Okay. Um, they bought it. Like they, they bought it. They were like, that's great. We love... We love that movie. We're trying to do a level of special effects in this movie that will that will kind of, you know, delight audiences to the same degree that Star Wars delighted audiences when it came out. So, you know, I lied. Um, I lied that I didn't have mm-hmm. a criminal record. I lied that I had a good credit history. I lied that I had not had bad interactions with Keanu Reeves on previous jobs. I lied about all that. That takes moxie. I don't know anybody who doesn't get a job in Hollywood with a, without a little fibbing. The reason I got this intern job is um well, I don't I don't, really, I don't want to say I lied as if it was miscommunication. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Andy wanted to know if I if I knew word. You know what I'm saying? New mm-hmm. word. And I was like, I I know a word, but I forgot to put the a in there in the resume, so it made it seem like I know word. And um, it looked weird because I, I wanted to put I know a word and then I put dot 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 charcuterie. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That that's a great example of even though you didn't mean to lie it, it was a little bit of a miscommunication that helped get you the job exactly no, and, and, and that's the thing um i want to know what was it like on set of the matrix i mean right. you got superstars you got was, first of all you got you got you got mr reeves incredible you know what I'm saying? you got yano there yeah and then you got lawrence mother effing fishburn yes what is it like being on set with that what a thrill i mean just like he's he's a star He's an icon, uh, an incredible performer, uh, a class act of a gentleman. Mm -hmm. Um, It was an inspiration. I met him because I went and trapped him in a slime pod during lunch for fun, and he loved it. How was it, you know, growing up and you you thought to yourself, I want to be in Hollywood? I wanted to be an actor when I was a kid. I wanted to be in front of the cameras, but... Pretty early on, I realized that 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 just wasn't the way it was going to go for me. I got into some regional theater. Mm -hmm. I just found myself drawn to props and set direction. And I wouldn't worry about my lines. I would just be like, hey, I think we could slime up the set here a little bit. you know? And they'd be like, hey, that's not your department. And I was like, man, maybe it should be my department. Yeah. Do you have any goals of being more than just a uh, assistant to PA? Yes. I want to be in charge of an art department. You know, I'm happy being the slime PAA. 
but I, I want to run the whole show. I want to be in charge of set decoration. I want to consult with the costumers over the vibe. I want to, you know, I would love to be an art director for like a period movie, you know, something where, there's, mm-hmm. something where the art direction is really a huge part of it. You know, maybe, maybe like a, a Jane Austen type movie, you know, or, you know, just some kind of genre picture, um, mm-hmm. like a Western or something like that, where, you know, they're really wanting the, the look to be accurate and, and informed. Do you feel you have the talent and the, the capability to, to, to pull something like that off? Right now, no. Okay. Right now, I'm mostly slime oriented, but I, I'm great at learning as I go. Um, for example, when the Matrix started, uh, after the slime pod scene went so well, I started sliming everything. You know, every scene in the Matrix had to, the first take, I would kind of get in there for last looks when they're, when they're putting mm-hmm. makeup on the actors right before the role. Just put a little slime. Get a little slime in there? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, it was pointed out to me that that was not always serving the scene. That sometimes mm-hmm. it did not make sense for these guys to look slimy. Although, I got a lot in there. If you watch The Matrix today, there's a lot of guys looking slimy. How do you feel knowing that nobody's really giving you credit for the creation of this of this slime as opposed to you're just, you're just doing what everybody else is doing? There's no originality there. It's so frustrating because, you know, nobody was talking slime on The Matrix before I got there. They were thinking mm-hmm. dry, dry, dry. I'm the one who brought the idea of slime. There'd be no slime in The Matrix. It would have been a dry pod. It would have been Keanu just stretching his... The original art direction called for a bunch of bunk beds, that the Matrix was actually a series of bunk beds attached to a computer. And I was like, what about a slime pod? The the, the slime, at some point, it kind of felt like kind of out of place. I just wasn't no, expecting I hear slime, that. You know, you, know, you, you look slime. back at your work, and I look yeah, at yeah. some of those scenes, and I'm like, could have used a little less slime here. I I, I totally agree. But there's a Because it, it was like, I, yeah, I seen the slime, and then he dried off so fast. I was like, I don't... I don't know what's going on in this situation. Yeah, know? he dried off too fast. I don't know. But I don't know. More often than not, I think a little more. I think it's better to have too much slime than too little. Have you ever used slime outside of the work environment? And if so, where? Uh, I use it all the time. So I wear the slime as an outfit every day. Um, you know, it sort of looks like I'm walking around with just like a thick membrane on me. But I'm like, I'm yeah. snug as a bug. I feel like every time you walk out, you just look like you was just born. People should look like they were just born more. I think people don't look like that enough. And it, it shows innocence, you know, it shows innocence in this world. And we you live know, in like such it, a cynical age that exactly. people were just willing to look innocent by putting slime on themselves so they look like they were just born. Man, what a nicer world this would be. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to thank you for the interview, Mr. Will Hines. It's always great to hear from you. Of course. Um, everybody else, please enjoy the rest of the podcast. And that's our show for today. Join us next week for an amazing chapter novelized by Kelsey Abbott and narrated by Tom Sharpling. Stephen, unplug us from this matrix. Sure thing. Thanks to this week's guests, Matthew Mercer, Josh Lieb, and Will Hines. The Novelizers is produced by me, Stephen Levinson, with Graham Douglas, Kevin Carter, Christine Bowen, Dennis DeClaudio, Rob Kuttner, and Suchetis Bokil. Music by Cole Emoff. Graphic design by Crystal Dennis. Theme song by Andrew Lynn performed by Knotts, reprise performed by Paige Beller. Special thanks to Chris Karawalski and WYSO Radio in Yellow Springs, Ohio. The Novelizers is a work of parody unauthorized by Warner Brothers. Follow The Novelizers on Instagram, Threads, Facebook, and TikTok, and please donate to our Patreon. Copyright 2024, Novelizers, LLC. There was a matrix made of computers There was a guy who could dodge all the bullets He lived in fluid, just like a fetus But he was born again like baby Jesus Ooh.